Hi, welcome to Copyright and Publishing, Part 1, Traditional Publishing. My name is Tabitha Octero. I am the Electronic Resources Librarian here at Malloy College. I am also the Administrator for both Digital Commons at Malloy and the Expert Gallery Suite. I am a librarian. I am an archivist. I have two certificates in copyright, one for educators and librarians and one for multimedia. I also find copyright to be very interesting and there are a lot of different areas of copyright. Given all of the things I am, the one thing I am not is a lawyer, so I cannot offer you legal advice. This module will cover a very specific aspect of US copyright. Like I said before, there are a lot of components to copyright. Today we will deal specifically with copyright and publishing. What is copyright? This screenshot was grabbed directly from the FAQ section of copyright.gov, the official website of the US Copyright Office. Copyright is a form of protection grounded in the U.S. Constitution and granted by law for original works of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. It covers both published and unpublished works. There are a bunch of things that copyright does not protect, such as facts, ideas, systems, or methods of operation. And copyright is different from both a patent or a trademark. So copyright protects original works of authorship or creatorship. These could be literary, dramatic, musical, artistic works, poetry, novels, movies, songs, computer software, architecture. Anything that you can fix in a tangible medium can be protected by copyright. It will not be protected by copyright until it is fixed in that tangible medium. So once this presentation is complete and I hit stop on recording, this video will be protected by copyright. When I finished creating all of my slides in this presentation, that PowerPoint was protected and is protected by copyright. Copyright does not protect things that are intangible. So anything that's not fixed in some form. It also does not protect ideas. If you have the idea of a boy wizard going to wizard school to learn magic, copyright does not protect that. However, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, that is a book, it is also a movie, I am sure it's also an audiobook. Those things are protected by copyright because it is fixed in a tangible form. Facts and data. So water boiling at sea level at 100 degrees Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit, that's a fact. If you ran a survey and came to the conclusion that 57% of librarians wish they had a second cardigan at their desk because it's so cold in the library, that's data. That is also not protected. However, any conclusions or interpretations that you draw from that would be protected. And anything spontaneous. So by its very nature, it cannot be fixed, so it cannot be protected. This would include things like interpretive dance. Knowing your rights, there are five or six rights, depending on who you ask, that go with copyright. And the first is reproduction. So I wrote a book, and I have the right to make as many copies as I want. The second right is distribution. So I wrote my book, I made a bunch of copies, and now I am handing them all out. The third is derivative works. My book was so successful that I have decided I'm going to translate it into a, another language, or I'm going to turn it into a movie, or I'm going to turn it into a play. 
public performance. I'm going to take that play, which is now its own separate work, so it also has all of these rights associated with it, and I'm going to publicly perform it. If I created something like a piece of art or architecture, I have the right to publicly display it. And then last, digital audio transmission. This covers sound recordings. Some things that are also good to know. Copyright is automatic. I am not sure why, but most people I talk to do not know that copyright is automatic. So once the thing is created, it is protected by copyright. You do not need to publish something in order for it to be protected by copyright. This has been the case since the 1989 Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works. So anything created after 1989 is automatically protected by copyright. As such, you don't need to put the copyright notice on it. That is the little C in a circle, although it is still highly suggested that you do mark your work in some way, since many people don't know that copyright is automatic. Copyright lasts for the life of the creator plus 70 years. So again, that's for anything that was created after 1989. For anything before that, you would have to do a double check to see how long copyright lasts. As of now, which is the end of August 2019, anything that was published before 1923 is in the public domain and is no longer protected by copyright. Copyright.gov has all of the information that you would need, but it is in a little bit of legalese, so keep that in mind going in. Also, if you wish to register your work so that it is registered with the U.S. Copyright Office, you would have to do that through copyright.gov. Something to keep in mind, if in the future you ever suspect somebody of infringing upon your copyright rights, in order to take them to court, your work does need to be registered with copyright.gov. Copyright is also transferable, and this is where publishers come in. Copyright is usually automatically transferred to a surviving family member after the creator's death. However, the creator can do whatever they want with their copyright. So at any point, they can place their work in the public domain, either marking it with the public domain mark, which is on the right-hand side of the screen, it's the C in the circle with a line through it, or marking it as no rights reserved, thereby giving everyone access to it and then people can do whatever they want with that work. And the creator can do this at any time, any point, and they can also transfer their copyright to someone. Usually this is a publisher, and this happens when you're going through the publishing process. Um, you will have to sign something that's called a copyright transfer agreement or copyright transfer statement or something that is names very similar. And the process will vary a little by publisher, but that part won't. You will need to sign something. This is a copyright transfer agreement sample that I got from Wiley's website. So in this example, you are writing, or you wrote, an article. Right here on the first page, and this is several pages long, it says that publication cannot proceed without a signed copy of this agreement, and this is very much the case with traditional publishing. On the second page, it talks about retained rights. So once your work is published, depending on the version, you have different rights that you get to keep as the creator. Wiley calls these versions submitted, accepted, and final published. I have been known to call them preprint, postprint, and final PDF. But depending on the version that you're looking at, you will have different rights and different things that you can do with that particular version. Right here on page four, it says copyright notice. So Wiley will be placing that little C in a circle somewhere on the article that you are publishing with them. Next page, you have to sign. Remember page one said that you cannot proceed with publication unless you have a signed agreement. And then the last page covers employees of the US government. 
but this is pretty typical. Why does it matter? Once you sign that copyright transfer, whatever the document is actually called, once you sign it, the work is no longer yours. It now belongs to the publisher. So the six rights of copyright, reproduction, distribution, derivative works, public performance, public display, digital audio transmissions, those six rights that were yours when you created your piece of work, those rights now belong to the publisher. This greatly affects how you can share your work online. You can always share a link to the publication or the DOI. That's always fine. The publisher will place limitations on sharing full text. Sometimes instead of calling it author rights, this will be referred to as self-archiving somewhere on the publisher's website. And where would you self-archive? Pretty much anywhere that you would share your work online. So a personal website, an institutional repository such as Digital Commons at Malloy, a subject-specific preprint repository such as Car Cornell's Archive, uh, social media, academic social media, that would be sites like uh, academia.edu or researchgate.net, or a closed system such as an institution's intranet. Going back to the Wiley example with the copyright transfer agreement, remember they called the different versions submitted, accepted, and final. This is a chart that I have on the Digital Commons LibGuide, and you can see the URL towards the top of the page. Depending on the version, or let me put it this way, the version dictates what you can do with it. So most publishers allow you to share the preprint. That is the first submitted manuscript and it happens before the peer review process. There are subject specific preprint repositories, especially for any of the sciences. There's a bunch of them for sciences. The postprint would be the version that comes after peer review Usually some type of editor or copy editor has looked at it, but it does not have the final layout or pagination or markings that would be in the very final published version. Many publishers allow you to share the postprint, not as many as preprint though. The publisher's PDF or the final version of your work, whether it is a book, a book chapter, an article, only 25% of publishers, in the traditional sense, allow you to share the full text of your final published PDF. So what does that mean? That means that you cannot take the full final published PDF of an article that you wrote and post it on Facebook. You would be infringing on copyright because it's not yours anymore. Um, it also means that you can't take somebody else's PDF. So you found an article that you really like. You can't take that, take the full text of it, and put it on Twitter. Um, those things are infringing on somebody else's copyright. And that's usually where I find um, creators have a hard time with copyright because they made it. It was theirs. It still is yours, kind of, like you did create it but you no longer hold its copyright. The publisher holds its copyright. If you're looking for more information about this or about sharing your work online, you can visit the Digital Commons and Expert Gallery Suite LibGuide. You can also go to the Scholarly Publishers Toolkit LibGuide. We do have a Copyright Basics LibGuide, or if you wanted to know more specifically about copyright, you can go to the U.S. Copyright Office's website at copyright.gov. This concludes Copyright and Publishing Part 1, Traditional Publishing. Thank you.